664. What a friend we have in Jesus. 664.
Okay, Mark 512. Use the invitation 512. Delivering our lesson this morning is Jason Giebler. Uh, Jason and his wife Sarah are members at the congregation at Hillcrest. In fact, he spoke there just a few weeks ago. My dad told, him, told me that he did such an awesome job, I need to have him come up here. So, so we certainly are glad that he's here. Uh, when, when I talked to Jason last Sunday about him speaking this morning, I figured we'd just have normal worship service. But uh, the week has certainly brought uh, difficult challenges and some changes. Pray that God's will be done through all of this and we'll all remain safe. But uh, without further ado, we'll have Jason deliver the gospel message this time. Jason. I think I have both forms of microphone on. So thanks for having me here with you today. Truthfully, this is like a visiting preacher's worst nightmare when somebody hears that you're coming and then the crowd shows up and we've got, you know, eight or ten people here is all. But I think we can get through that and I hope many of you are tuning in uh, from uh, a variety of different uh, electronic uh, opportunities. So the congregation here, as I understand, is coming into uh, some exciting times with a, a new minister on, on board shortly. Uh, that is a, a very exciting time. And I would like to throw this out there that what I'm doing here this morning is really a, a simple task. It's, a, it's pinch hitting. Pinch hitting is an easy thing because I can come to you with a lesson that's been on my heart and, and share that with you. But I'm not the one tasked with sustaining this week after week, month after month, year after year. So a portion of that's going to come from your new minister. But the greatest portion of that is going to be from the way that you get behind that new minister and make certain that he and his family are, are as welcome as they can be so that he has the ability to sustain uh, the work of, of the gospel and make things as good uh, for the church in Joplin as they can possibly be. So that would be my encouragement for you. I, I would also throw this out in a variety of conversations over the course of the last couple of weeks, but sp specifically the last week, and, and not even necessarily just with the Church of Christ. There are so many people who are spending a lot of time questioning the actions of their leaders. They're questioning the actions of our political leaders. They're questioning the action of leaders in the workplace. And they're questioning the actions of, of leaders that would decide this morning to have a, a group of, which would typically be uh, a hundred or more to a dozen or so of us here at this point. And I think there's a lot of good things that you should question. But when we have trying times and difficult things, trust that your uh, elders here and, and the leadership at the congregation where you attend is doing the best that they can to, to make those things happen. So keep those things in, in perspective as we recognize that normal life as we know it is, is not going to be normal for some time uh, to come. COVID-19 is the topic of the day, and we're going to try not to spend too much time on it as our topic of today, uh, but it's disrupted work for some, uh, school for most, recreation for many. Uh, traditional worship as we know it is obviously impacted this morning. So if we use this time of abnormality to bring focus back to some of the things that slip away from us in the hustle and the bustle of life, we can actually use this as we can use nearly anything as a blessing to help us in our Christian walk. Uh, those of us who are sports fans, and that's many, and feel like that you're missing out on most of the important things in life right now because everything has either been canceled, postponed, or, or indefinitely changed, um, Maybe this lesson this morning is going to have a few nuggets in it for you because we're going to take a few specific examples from my life many years ago as a, uh, a college athlete and we're going to take a look at those and make some application there in, uh, I think, in the life of those who are athletes, those who are uh, armchair quarterbacks, and, and those of us who simply do the things that we do on, uh, on a daily basis. The place was Civic Stadium in Portland, Oregon. The date was December the 5th of 1992, and the event was the semifinal round of the NCAA Division II National Championship. The competitors were the Portland State Vikings and the Pittsburgh State Gorillas. The temperature was bone chilling, uh, hovering somewhere around uh, zero with the wind chill. Snow was piled up around the edges of the field. It was pushed off uh, so that we could actually play the game. Exposed flesh and fingers were raw from the cold, and it made normal things that happen in football like tackling and blocking all the more painful because of the, uh, of the impact to the cold skin. Pittsburgh State would end up winning the game 42-35 to 35 on the way to the national championship game the following week. 
But the reason for this story is not to talk about that. It's to talk about some explanations of things deeper in the game of football and the impact that they had on my life and hopefully the impact that they can have on your life as we spend a little bit of time uh, together today. As each game starts off with a kickoff, there's a play that any of you who've played football before or watched it, they call it simply the wedge. And it's the receiving team forms a wedge and they're to protect the ball carrier as he takes off. And Pittsburgh ran an adaptation of that play of which that we would fake like we were running the wedge, but at the last possible moment, I would be on the left-hand side and the ball carrier would holler and I'm supposed to take off and, and clear the path for him to make it around the outside. It worked really well in the first play of the game was we returned the, the kickoff for, for an opening touchdown. But the point of that is that the kicker on Portland State was exceptionally talented and he'd get the ball so high in the air that the hang time didn't allow me any momentum as I was being run into by another person. So my 270 pounds and the 250 pounds of the guy that was coming down to try to bust up that play had a tremendous impact at that point and, and obviously now on my life and in, uh, in the future. But if you can imagine the scenario there where you take 270 pounds and 250 pounds and hit together, you have a literal explosion. And that explosion is, is, is very dynamic, especially to the heads of the two young men that are crashing each other together. And this play would take place dozens of times in a game that scored 77 points uh, throughout the course of the day. But on one particular play, the explosion was so dynamic and so intense that I actually saw white lights, more than little birdies, but white lights. And, and my entire left side of my body went numb. And I had a ringing in my ears, and I really desperately wanted somebody to call timeout but I was still on my feet and I wasn't gonna be the one to do that. It wouldn't have been manly, right? And so I didn't wanna show the weakness. I didn't wanna request it, but feeling like I could pass out, I stumbled back to the huddle. And as we, and probably several others on the team were thinking, man, I wish somebody would just call timeout. The referee blew the whistle and he blew it dead at that point in time. And then we looked back and the guy that had collided with me was passed out on the field over here on this side, obviously feeling worse than I was at that point in time. But here's the point of all this, big long story, but the point of all this is that we have figurative collisions like this in our lives on a daily basis. We run into things that is a literal explosion uh, in our lives and we need someone to call time out, but we aren't willing to do it ourselves and others around us don't see the need, so we push on with our spiritual lives suffering when what we need is some time back in that proverbial huddle that can give us all so much blessing. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Probably a scripture familiar to, to many of you. But in the ninth verse of chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, it says, And he has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So if you're taking notes or you just want to know what the title of this sermon is this morning, that, that is it. When I am weak, then I am strong. So let's talk about these huddles in the way that um, they work most effectively in providing our, our needed support. You know, physically, there's a there's a, a thought that those that are non-football players think that the huddle is put together so that the other team can't see the play that you're getting ready to call. But from the experience I just described, that, that is part of it, but it's also a leaning post where people can lean in and catch our breath and, and get the feeling back in whatever appendage it is that's been damaged during that, that portion of the play. But it only works in that huddle if everyone is exerting their influence in the same manner. If everyone's leaning in together, there's equilibrium. If some people are leaning in and some people are leaning out, it doesn't work very well. I could take any one of you in the congregation and bring you up here and we could lean on each other and hold each other up. But if I lean and you lean back, we'll stumble and we'll fall. So the question that I would throw out there is, are you physically giving the effort that you need to be to support to this congregation? Or are you the one who's leaning out and let the huddle crumble as a result? of your unwillingness to do what it is that you need to do? Do you make yourself available to provide service when service is needed? Can you be counted on to support the physical efforts of this congregation? 
Are you setting an example and teaching others around you what servant leadership is all about? Or are you doing something entirely different? So this huddle doesn't only support us physically, but it gives us the opportunity to be supported emotionally. And it only works if we trust each other. Trust is a building block of so many different things. But can we open ourselves up to be vulnerable enough to give and take from each other in a way that promotes growth? Are you open enough emotionally to ask for help and support the emotional health of others so we grow as the Lord's body together? Are you willing to go deeper and are you willing to dig deeper to strengthen yourself and to strengthen others? Do you let others get to know you and seek others out to do the same? Or do you stay shelled up in your own little, little uh, a hole and, and aren't willing to, to share with others? Can you willingly open up to others about life experiences? And, and when I say life experiences, it, it's so that they can have the support they need to manage challenges in their lives because you have dealt with something like that before. Are you willing to mentor others and to be mentored? Maturity can support those who are less mature if we're willing to do so. Do you plan activities with the intent to support the growth of the kingdom of God? Or do you just do whatever it is that pleases you? If you are willing to drop the what's in it for me mentality or attitude and seek to serve, then a lot of good is going to come uh, from that. But if you're willing to, to drop the what's in it for me in your church membership and attendance, in your leadership, in your parenting, in your employment, in your relationships, in all your activities, can those you touch tell that you are truly trying to do the good work of the kingdom? Or would it be a, an accident if they actually found that out about you? So physically and emotionally, the huddle works for us, but the huddle also works for us from a spiritual perspective. But it only works if we give ourselves to grow spiritually and to promote the growth of others through our, willingness, through our willing and pure actions. Are your spiritual activities and actions patterned after the example set for us by Christ in such a way that it shows you're invested in your salvation? So I, I use the word invested here because if you think about things right now, especially in the times, I had a conversation with a guy this morning that called and said, he just stopped opening his 401k and his investment things because he just had no idea how bad his investments were, were doing right that. And I said to him, I'd say they're probably doing pretty bad. But I think there's other things that we can worry about this morning. So when we talk about investment, we've got to take and ask, are we physically, emotionally, spiritually invested in the work of the church? And if we are, guess what, guys? Everything else is going to work out okay. Everything will work out okay. Do you seek the opportunity to share your faith, even when it's uncomfortable? Do you do so even when it could cost you, financially, physically, emotionally? Do you take the opportunity to build up your spirituality so that you can better provide service to others? And, and I think of some of these things, once again, that, that are disrupted. It was just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a uh, lectureship over in Oklahoma City affirming the faith. Um, if that was happening now, they'd have the kibosh put it on it, I'm sure. But there were literally a thousand people that showed up to, to worship and to study and to learn and, and get together. Those opportunities present themselves the, the calendar year over. Do we take advantage of those opportunities? Gospel meetings. Once again, gospel meeting on the move. It's moved at this point, and we're not sure exactly what's happening. But eventually we'll get back to that and, and give it an opportunity uh, to do good work in our lives and the lives of the people that we touch uh, from that. Teaching. Preaching, devotionals, sometimes those are the forced study that you're required to do to make sure that you uh, can benefit others uh, through God's word. Home devotionals and instruction. Do you read and study the Bible? Do you have purposeful self-improvement actions with Christ at the center of those activities? Do you entertain and participate in spiritual goal setting? We have... Career goals, we have financial goals, we have uh, physical fitness goals. Do we add spiritual goals to those as well? If not, take a step back. There's plenty of time uh, to do that. In the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, just over a few pages from where we were a few minutes ago, we'll be looking at the 23rd and the 24th verses. And they say, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. 
All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. And with reading that, I would ask the question, are our actions promoting what is good for others so that we can reap the reward for those around us, for this congregation, for the congregation that those of you who are watching and listening at home are attached with? Are we using the huddle, and if so, are we using it to our greatest advantage? Are we giving our best effort? Do we have a group that we can huddle with to fix what ails us so we can rejoice spiritually? Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Some of you have probably seen the 2006 movie, uh, Facing the Giants. If you haven't seen the movie, I really strongly recommend it. I can think of nothing in that movie that you shouldn't be exposed to. And if you have seen it, I can strongly recommend you go home and watch it again because it's a, it's a really good one. And I've seen all kinds of people posting on Facebook and talking and saying, I'm bored to death and I can't, you know, watch something that edifies. Uh, be involved in something that does. But in one particular scene, which I would call the death crawl scene in Facing the Giants, um, the coach on the team is trying to get a little bit more out of one of his captains on the team. Brock Kelly is the young man's name. And The practice is over, they've done their conditioning and whatnot, and they're sitting off to the side of the field, and someone says to the coach, hey, what do you think about the team that we are playing this weekend? And before coach can even answer the question, Brock Kelly says, well, they're a whole lot better than us. Which coach says, Brock, are we already defeated? He said, well, not if I thought we could actually win. And he says, Brock, stand up here for a second. And so Brock stands up, and he says to him, hey, I want you to do something for me. And he says, what's that, coach? Am I in trouble now? And coach says the, the infamous words, not yet. Parents have probably used that on their children many, many times, and probably more this last week than, than any other time. But the reality of the situation is, is he wants him to do something called the death crawl. And those of you who participated in football activities at some point in time may remember the death crawl. It may be seared indelibly into your mind where there's no way that you can ever, ever forget it. But it is a all fours activity that involves feet and hands only. You're not touching your knees, you're not touching any of your body, and you crawl. And in this particular instance, he's going to ask Brock Kelly to crawl with another player sitting on his back. And Brock says, how far do you want me to go, to the 30? Because traditionally they would go to the 20-yard line. He says, I think you can make it to the 50. He said, well, I can make it to the 50 with nobody on my back. And he says, Brock, I think you can make it to the 50 with someone on your back. But I got a question for you. Are you going to give me your best? And Brock kind of nonchalantly says, yeah. He says, no, really. Are you going to give me your best? And he says, yeah, yeah, I'll give you my best. So enter the death crawl scene. And he gets down on his hands and his feet. This other guy gets on his back, and they take off. And the coach is walking along beside him. But the trick here is that he's blindfolded him beforehand. And he says, why are you blindfolding me? He says, because I don't want you giving up when you still have something left in the tank to give. And they take off. And it's going along pretty rapidly at first, and Coach is walking along beside him. And he's encouraging him as he goes along, and he's encouraging him pretty quietly at this point in time. And as Brock starts to falter and stops, he says, don't give up on me now. He says, I'm not not giving up. I'm just taking a break for a second. And they go on, and at this point, you can see that they're probably at the 20 to 30 yard line somewhere around in there. But then things zoom in on the screen very directly to just those two people. I don't have the thematic music and everything going on right here, but I think, I think you get the picture. So as they're zoomed right in on that, you see them making progress, and as Brock struggles a little bit more, and he starts to yell out because his arms are killing him, and he's in pain, and the coach is telling him, you negotiate with your body to give a little bit more. And they keep pushing, and they keep pushing, and he keeps asking one question as he goes along. Brock, are you giving me your absolute best? And Brock is going as hard as he can go, and he keeps going. And things are starting to get extremely intense, and he's, he's failing quickly. And his arms are shaking, and the steps are getting more slow. And coach is yelling at him, 30 more steps. Brock, give me your best, give me your best. And Brock's yelling, it hurts, I'm in pain, I can't go anymore. And he's down at this point, and he's crawling along beside his player, encouraging him along, screaming at him, yelling at him, don't leave anything on the field, don't give me anything but your absolute best. And this continues on. And continues on. And he finally gets to the point and he's saying, Coach, I can't do it anymore. And he's saying, you've got more in the tank. Ten more steps. Nine more steps. And as he gets down to five, four, three, two, one, and collapses over the line of the end zone, a hundred yards from where he started with a man on his back, he leans down there and he says, 
Brock, you've got a lot more in the tank than what you're showing me. And the leadership that you can provide and the leadership that you can offer take us places that we haven't ever been before, but you've got to give me your absolute best. So I can put that perspective into my life as well and ask myself the question, do I give up at times? Would I be better off sometimes blindfolded, trusting blindly that someone was going to encourage me and, and take me where? Or, or do I often say, that's good enough? You guys often say, that's, that's good enough. I think I've had enough at this point. And as we see the challenges in society today and the challenges with, with people, uh, employment and school and finances, there's going to be a lot of people that are pushed beyond the limits that they've been comfortable with for some, for some time. But there's also going to be people that recognize that they can do a little bit more. And if we can encourage others to do a little bit more, and we can encourage ourselves to do a little bit more, things are going to get better. But with the, without that combined effort of participant and encourager, the team would not have been able to see the example of what it takes to succeed laid out before them. Philippians 4.13, we all know that. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, and that's great. And that clip in the movie is great. But what I really want to take away from the ex example is the question that was asked so many times during the movie clip, will you promise me your best? And he asked it again, are you going to give me your best? And dozens of times through the course of that hundred yards, he continued to ask the question, are you giving your best? And then he's screaming at him, are you giving me your absolute best? Is what he's asking. Don't worry where you are. Don't give up until you don't have anything else left to give. God asks us each day, and we need to answer, are you giving it all to me? So I would ask each of you today if you're giving your best. And here's a few examples, and I hope that you can take these examples and expand upon them and, and create more examples in your own life. But I would ask parents in your parenting, are you willing to be the parent instead of the buddy to your child? Teachers in your teaching, are you willing to give the effort even when it seems unappreciated? Preachers in your preaching, are you willing to give pertinent lessons that grow the congregation that you serve? Deacons in your service, are you willing... To do what it takes to serve even when the job seems thankless or unnoticed or behind the scenes. Elders in your leadership. Are you willing to dig underneath the superficial service of a congregation to understand what the real needs are of a congregation so that growth happens for your body and the body of Christ universally? Congregation, are you willing to, to participate in your financial stewardship to make certain that the work of the Lord decided upon by your elders can be funded appropriately. Christians in your example, in your prayer life, in your willingness to study with others. Friends in your friendship. Can you be open and honest with yourself and your friends so that good and encouragement, encouraging results come from it? Spouses in your marriages. Are you willing to make the effort today, tomorrow, and next year to strengthen the marriage that you've entered into? Employees in your work, are you really giving your employer what they are paying you for? Ask yourself this question, would you hire you if you were the hiring manager for the effort that you gave today? Teens in your relationships and the way that you conduct yourselves in the community. That's 10 or 11 examples. You guys could probably come up with 10 or 11 more that I missed. And I would expect you to come up with 10 or 11 more and ask yourself the question each time, am I giving my absolute best? And if you can't answer in the affirmative, and if you say, no, I spend my life pretty much saying that's enough. That's enough of that, really. Start giving your absolute best. In the book of Colossians, uh, chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it says, Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. Listen to this. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25 says, All the runners run, but only one receives the prize. And listen to this final point in there. 
Run so that you obtain it. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I think perfect examples within the scripture of understanding what it feels like and sees and what we would see if we were doing our best. 2 Timothy 4, 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And that's a challenge thrown out for each of us every day. But as we move from this point to the next point, I ask you the question again. Can you ask yourself and answer in the affirmative, am I giving my absolute best? Back to Pittsburgh State. We spent an awful lot of time lifting weights because we needed to be bigger, we needed to be faster, we needed to be stronger. And one of the things that we would do once a week was an exercise called narrow grip bench press. A narrow grip bench press is much more difficult than regular bench press because your arms are in a very compromised position. So instead of being out here, which is natural, you're right here, it's unnatural. And the coaches would have us do whatever our maximum amount of weight was, and they would reduce that by 40%. So we would do 60%, and we had to do it for 25 repetitions. And it was at the end of our upper body workout, and we were always worn out, and it was impossible. Literally impossible. So those of you who've done any serious weightlifting will recognize that it is impossible. And so you say, well, why did the coaches use this technique on us? First and foremost, coaches like to inflict pain on their, on their uh, uh, patients, as you would call it in, in, in this instance. But they also wanted us to improve dramatically. And college coaches are dealing with a game that's become a multi-million dollar industry. And so if they don't win, they don't come back next year. But coaches have to find ways to force growth physically and emotionally in the players that they're given the opportunity uh, to lead. So you want to know how it went? Well, I already told you that it was impossible, okay? It felt very awkward at first using muscles that you didn't traditionally use. The first time I could do one or two by myself alone. Further on, I could do three or four or five or six. You could never get to the point of doing 25. It, it, it was physically impossible. But we used a spotter. So this is the key point right here. A spotter is a person that stands behind the bench or persons that stand behind the bench and lift that weight off of you when you fail. So if you understand what a spotter does, and some of you may be getting ahead of me now and recognizing what a spotter could do in our spiritual life as well, but the next few days after we started that, we had extreme muscle pain. And a few days after that, we had extreme muscle growth. So the question I would throw out with this is, are there spiritual things that we need to use this same principle to promote our Christian growth. What if we knew that someone would catch us when we fall, when we fail, when we stumble? Could we use a Christian spotter to pull the weight off of us when it gets too heavy? Let's turn to the book of Matthew, the 11th chapter. Be in verse 28 when you get there. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30 says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you ever find yourself in need of a spotter? Maybe more importantly, do you ever find that you could be that spotter for someone else if you were willing to step outside of yourself and make yourself available to others? So as I said a minute ago, it took me a while to get the hang of it, to get the muscle memory happening the way that it needed to happen. Have you heard the saying, anything worth doing is worth doing right? But what if that was changed to say it this way? Anything that is worth doing is worth doing poorly at first which would mean you don't have to be an expert. You don't even have to be good. You just have to be willing, okay? So we may not be the perfect spotter for others. We may not be the perfect encourager for others. We may not be perfect at anything, but we really don't have a great option other than to push on and try to do those things. We have to be willing to push ourselves outside of our comfort zones. If we stayed within our comfort zones always, We'd never grow. I think we're all supposed to stay in a personal zone of like six feet away from each other at, at this point in time. That's different right now than, than normal. But when we look at, I would ask you the questions, 
Are, are you willing to step outside the, your comfort zone? The, the first song that you lead will probably not be your greatest. The first prayer you lead may not be your best. The first class you teach will not be your most impactful. The first Bible study you lead will be a growth platform form for you, possibly more than the person you're actually trying to evangelize to. You may learn more from those that you, than you are actually teaching. The first time you share your faith with a classmate or a coworker or an acquaintance, it may seem really, really awkward. But the old saying, once again, there's a first time for everything. And then the next time's the second time, and the next time's the third time. And if we're going with old cliches, the third time's the charm, and it just gets better from there. And we continue to move on and upward and forward, and we're doing good things and good works as we go along. The gain is worth the pain. So start the journey. We lose our fear of taking on a task if we know that others are there to help us, and then we have the Lord's support. I paraphrase in Isaiah 41.10, but he says, Do not fear. Do not be anxious. I will strengthen and help you. And here's the spotter part. I will uphold you. If we've got that substance behind us and that backing behind us, shouldn't we be more confident than we are? Shouldn't we be more willing than we are? Shouldn't we be more outgoing than we are? If we think that the word of God and the gospel is worthwhile, it needs to be a part of our lives. Why wouldn't we want to share it with every single person that we come in contact with? There's going to be things that present themselves and give you opportunities to serve. There's activities within the congregation that require planning and setup and teardown. There's vacation Bible schools, lectureships and gospel meetings don't just happen. There's things that have to go on behind the scenes to make those type of things happen. There's ladies' days, there's outreach efforts, there's Bible studies. You guys can keep filling in that blank of areas that you could serve. But we've got to understand this. We win as a congregation. Or we can lose as a congregation. But we'll win if we're in it together with God. Romans 8.31 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? Don't allow yourself to always be helped without ever being the helper. If you can take a step back and say, man, I get an awful lot of help and I get an awful lot of assistance. I get an awful lot of things done for me, but I never reciprocate those actions. It's time to take a look at that and see what you can do to change in your life. Biblical example shows us time and time again that we must help those who need help. Acts twenty thirty five says it's more blessed to give than to receive. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, Paul's talking here. He says, Paul and Apollos planted and watered but God gave the growth. Your version might say, but God gave the increase. We want that increase. We want that increase in ourselves as we, as we mature spiritually. We want that increase in others that we come in contact with so that the church grows exponentially. So a few things that we should focus on today. I would ask you these questions again. Are you doing your part to support the huddle that we discussed, and, and, and not the physical football huddle, but the recognition that if we are pushing in and someone else is pushing in and we're all leaning together, then we're going to be stronger than we would be individually. But if one person steps out of that and lets that down, that whole entire group can come crumbling to the ground. Don't be that person. Don't be the person that lets the rest of the group down. If we're doing the right things, we provide the unity and the relational growth to make certain that we can withstand the pressures that come at us each day. I would ask you again, are you giving your best in the things that you do? And I would add to it, are you giving your best in everything that you do? Are you willing to take the steps needed today to make sure that you create an environment that gives and receives help and support and promotes spiritual growth? You know, none of this comes without focused effort. Probably something that I've mentioned in here today is very, very natural to do. I'm cert- natural to you. I'm certain that not everything that I've mentioned is completely natural and, and comfortable uh, for you. So we've got to work on it, and we've got to practice it, and we've got to continue that on and on and on. We've got to set that spiritual goal that says today's where I, this is where I am. Tomorrow, this is where I want to be. And ultimately, if we've done that, then the words of Matthew twenty-five, twenty-one. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in will be words that we hear 
So a lot of you here this morning and listening today from whatever congregation you're a part of have been part of that congregation for an extremely long time. I know people that have been part of a congregation and they're, and they're my age and they've been part of a congregation from the day that they were born and they grew up in it and they attended Bible classes there and they've, they've moved up within that congregation to a role of leadership and they're, they're doing good things. But the reality is that we can get complacent at times because we deal with the same things and the same people and the same stuff all the time. But I hope the challenges that I presented to you today are opportunities that you'll take a look at to recognize that we can create positive change. We can create change within ourselves so that we can create changes within the congregation, so we can create changes within the community, so we can create changes within the world. But you have to look honestly at yourself. You have to look in the mirror and ask if what you're doing is what it takes to make a difference. And I say the mirror because that's probably going to be a private spot that you're looking in that mirror and you have the odd opportunity to say to yourself, am I really doing what it takes to make a difference? And then can you be convicted enough to make the changes that are necessary in your life? Because I can guarantee you that everybody sitting here this morning and everybody watching has changes that they need to make within their life. And it requires honesty by all of us on each of these topics to convict us of the need for spiritual transformation. It, it takes courage, but hopefully this message this morning bolsters you with that courage to recognize that you're not on your own, that we have a huddle. And if you don't have one, you need to get one. You need to surround yourself with the right people and be willing to surround others as one of those right people to make it happen. You've got to recognize that the, there's assurance that this message this morning has hope for you and that with that spiritual spotter that you get and that you provide, that nobody is tackling this challenge alone. We're working through it. But whatever changes that you need to make, you need to make them with the best interest of the kingdom of God at heart. So are you giving as good as you're getting in the huddle, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? Are you giving your best in everything that you set your hand to? Are we willing to be that spotter for others that we're always going to check up on others and make sure that if they're facing a challenge, that they're not facing it alone? Because what goes around comes around, and good things will happen for those that, that bless others. So by virtue of the way that we're set up here this morning, a, there may be people that are needing to make decisions, and those decisions are a little bit more challenging today because wherever you're at, if you're watching us electronically, you may not have a baptistry sitting behind you as, as we have right here. Uh, so in a moment, we're going to offer an invitation and be led in an invitation song. And so if there's those here that need to make that, that uh, uh, need known, you're welcome to come. But for those that may be impacted by this and recognize that there's study in your life that, and, and needs and that you may need to put on our Lord in baptism, there's a group of, of elders here as well that can certainly be reached out to to uh, help us in that uh, situation. If you're watching electronically and, and you recognize that there's needs in your life that aren't uh, being met, I would recommend if you're in this area to connect with this congregation and try to be a, good, a part of the good work that's being done right here. But with all that in mind this morning, as we offer the invitation, I'll remind you one more time that it's okay to show vulnerability because we're all able to grow together. And back to the first scripture that we referenced this morning, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10 says that when we are weak, then we are strong. Whatever need you have this morning, please come as we stand and sing.
300, Psalm number 300, we'll use that song to prepare our minds for that. Number 300, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. When I survey the Seven 
references or quotes that we have of Jesus. And it's been my habit through the years that I try to go through those when I take communion on Sunday morning or Sunday night. And this one typifies the humanity of Jesus probably better than any other one. I thirst. He made absolutely no other ref reference to his suffering other than I thirst. It was he said, oh, my head hurt so bad after having that crown of thorns put on his head and deep with the reed. Or he didn't say my back is on fire from the scourge that I received from the hands of the Romans. Or he said my feet. I want you to picture a man hanging on the cross this morning literally covered head to toe in blood. And if you zoom in, there are his blood droplets dripping off his toes. But it's absolutely remarkable that Jesus never says anything that gives any attention to the physical suffering that he had. And it seems that from there was a craving that is portrayed in this thirst as the heart panteth for water and for brooks so panteth my soul after thee O God for my soul's thirst for the living God whom I shall come and appear and I will bow before him Psalms 42 1 and 2 I'm going to read this one chapter of this book that I thought was incredible Voices of Calvary for these 16 hours, through the entire weary night and into the morning hours the next day, he endured without rest or relief. We marvel that a physical body could endure so long the abuse of each day of his passion. We assume that Simon of Cyrene was drafted to carry the cross because Jesus was unable to, and perhaps fell beneath its weight. The Bible does not actually give this explanation, but it is reasonable to assume there's so many hours of emotional and physical abuse, including the barbarous scourging that have brought him to exhaustion. Then with nails in his feet and in his hands, holding his naked body and bleeding body that he had endured for three hours, the rays of the harsh Judean sun, darkness enveloped the earth from the sixth to the ninth hour. Through all these terrible hours, there was no murmuring, no complaining, no pleas at all for help. God's suffering servant opened not his mouth, quote from Isaiah 58, 7. Still flesh was flesh, and a word must be spoken to convey the agony that racked throughout the organs of Jesus' body, and he said, I thirst. Remind with me, please. Father God, it is important for us to pause in our lives and to slow down and to stop and to reflect and to huddle around the foot of the cross. And in doing so, we remember the tremendous sacrifice of our Lord and Savior and that through that sacrifice we can have hope. We never should minimize, neglect, or forget about the sacrifice that was paid at Calvary. Calvary was not just a place, and it was an event that affected all mankind before Christ came to earth and after and will for eternity. Father, please be with us as we partake of the bread which represents to Christians around the world his body that was given in our stead. And we ask it through his name. Amen.
and continue prayer. Father God, again we approach your throne of grace and uh, we are going to reflect on the blood that Jesus so willingly spilled on our behalf. And we know through scripture that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sins. And it took this blood of your spotless son, our Lord and Savior, for us to be redeemed and pure and justified in your sight. Again, help us recall the events that took place that day as we take it through the vine. We ask again in your son's name. Amen. Also command on the first day of the week to give a portion of back what God has blessed us with. Hold on to use this opportunity to do that. Father God, we thank you again for uh, uh, all the blessings that we enjoy and have. We want to give thanks to you for those blessings, both spiritual and physical. And uh, in some beautiful small way, we want to demonstrate that what we give back to you and all the blessings that we have received and give you credit and honor and glory for those blessings. Please bless the offering that it will be used to do only your will uh, here at this place. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The offering plan will be left here if you'd like to come up and put your money in it. That's where we're going to handle it. We'll close our service this morning with number 500, Whispering Hope. If you really pay attention to the words, I've done this one before, but really pay attention to the words today with everything going on. That's why I chose this song. Let's stand as we sing this and then dismiss with a prayer. 500.